when you come onto the land of another and your intentions are uh, peaceful, you have a moral and a legal claim in Kansai to be able to, to stay there. But whether you are permitted to stay when the danger is past, whether you can actually be a member of that society, he says this is a sovereign claim. And you know, if you can become, he says in the 18th century language, you know, a house genosse, a member of the big household, is going to be d dependent upon a volte tigefeta contract. I don't see this as a contract anymore. I think, first of all, there is a human right to nationality, which is Article 15 of the Universal Declaration. What this means is uh, that um, nobody's right to nationality can be arbitrarily revoked. And if you uh, have uh, left your uh, uh, country, you, know, you can still re-enter it. And states uh, should not really use denaturalizations as a matter of policy. I mean, much of the uh, tragedy, as Hannah Arendt reminds us, of the period uh, in Europe between the two world wars and that prepared the way for totalitarianism was the fact that you all of a sudden had millions of people who had been denaturalized, entbürgert, and there was nobody willing you know, to uh, help them, to stand up for them. You know, they did not have you know, legal uh, membership. So the right to um, a, be a member of an organized you know, political community is a human right. Now, what this means in terms of immigration policy uh, gets very, very complicated because, OK, um, let's distinguish between first admission and what happens after first admission. We'll come to first admission in a minute. When you, know, you come onto a land as an um, immigrant, as a uh, student, whatever, I think the human right claim is not that everybody who just enters a territory automatically becomes a citizen. I mean, citizenship entails being able to fulfill certain kinds of qualifications and conditions if you are a foreigner. And we can debate about which ones are more compatible with human right or not. But what we expect is there to be an open, transparent, uh, consistent way for the stranger to become a member of a state that is also compatible with human rights. So it doesn't mean that you know, the minute I arrive on your soil you know, with my bags that you, know, you have to give me the status of citizenship. No, but it means that there has to be a transparent, accountable, and open way. It's taken a long time to get there. I mean, there is, no, there is still no international law obliging states to provide citizenship. There is a right to exit, emigrate, but there is no right to immigrate in that, in that sense. But more and more, particularly, let's say, within the European Union, there is an attempt to compatibilize citizenship laws. So let's say you, know, you don't have to wait 15 years before you can raise a claim, you wait eight years. Uh, the question of how much language you need to have, whether you know you should be able to read, you know, Goethe or Schiller, you know, as opposed to just being able to read your bank account, you know, these kinds of these uh, these kinds of um, issues are being debated. Now, the question that is philosophically most difficult to answer is really the question of first um, first entry. How much sovereign power should states have still to deny first entry. I mean, I really think the argument about, you know, uh, the transition from entry membership to citizenship can be made. Now, you can take a radical position and say open borders. Well, uh, you know, there are days when I think that that's the only defensible solution. But my argument against you know, um, open borders is I don't believe um, uh, that uh, you know, uh, we will be able to have really any kind of uh, reasonable or significant democratic politics uh, with uh, a world you know, completely without any uh, kind of borders. But there is a distinction between boundaries and borders. Uh, borders are militarized and dangerous zones for people. You know, crossing a border is not like, you know, crossing a boundary. We cross boundaries in human life all the time. 
you know, when we are um, entering from one professional community to another, from one neighborhood to another, from one stage of our lives to another. But state boundaries are borders. They are militarized, they are protected by uh, police, by violence. Movement across borders is always considered criminal, unless you have the right papers. So maybe let's think about it this way. Is it possible to decriminalize this? I mean, of course, the European Union is one example. But, of course, the Schengen Agreement means, and here we are in Istanbul, that, you know, for many uh, Turks who are not residents within the European Union, uh, the Schengen visa uh, arrangement means that the border is still a potential criminal boundary. So one way to start thinking about this is also to start thinking of decriminalizing human movement. What was said in the conference was that I don't believe in multicultural jurisdictions. And I think that there is, uh, this was the, you know, very provocative because multicultural jurisdictions is really about the right of, you know, our religious and um, uh, a pretty religious and maybe even, you know, cultural groups to have their own, to have their own legal, uh, legal systems. Let's take some examples. There are some societies, uh, India, Israel, Canada, where uh, there are differential, you know, uh, rights and entitlement for individuals, usually in the domain of family law, usually in the domain of family law, depending on which, you know, uh, group they belong to. Uh, in Canada, this is the case for First Nations. In the United States, there has been an agreement, you know, with American, uh, American uh, natives and the U.S. Uh, and the U.S. government. Now, I have uh, argued, you know, since the claims of culture, that certain forms of multicultural arrangements may be compatible with democratic uh, societies if they fulfill certain conditions. First, members of um, cultural, religious, you know, um, ethnic groups should not be entitled to less civil and political rights because of their membership. I don't mind it if they're entitled to more, but they shouldn't be entitled to less, you know. The other thing is, I think, the right of exit and association. The state should not defend groups against individuals' right of exit and association. Why does this become relevant? For example, in the debate about the Sharia councils um, in the UK, uh, for them to arbitrate in the affairs of private uh, Muslim uh, family law. Uh, I don't find this development at all good, but I'm just like playing the experiment with your thought experiment. Uh, if the community puts pressure on the woman to have to go to the Sharia Council, even when she does not want to, right? Suppose she's a woman from Pakistan or Afghanistan. This is happening also mainly within the Pakistani community from where I can gather. You know, if the, there is an imposition upon her to have to go to that, I'm against it, okay? But if she herself, you know, chooses this, uh, we can accommodate. Now, of course, there's always also the problem of choice. One can't be naive about this, you know? When you're talking about um, uh, displaced minorities, oppressed minorities, people in conditions of immigration, what are we really talking about when we say, oh, you know, a Pakistani girl in Canada decided to go to the Sharia Council, you know, it's just, um, you know, this was her free choice. Very often it is not really a free choice because she's not informed of the alternatives. But, but in a liberal democratic state, if there are other groups that are granted these rights, we have to respect the moment of choice.